biotechnology continues to make a huge impact on how we diagnose, treat, and prevent some of the most complex viruses and devastating diseases. Biologics, which are drugs derived from living cells, are behind the vaccines that protect us from many infectious diseases, novel therapies for cancers, and breakthroughs in everything from heart disease to Alzheimer's. They are also transforming the industry. Once a niche within the biopharmaceutical sector, biologics now account for a growing share of new therapies and revenue. As an analyst covering biotechnology stocks for Morgan Stanley Research, I wanted to learn more about how one of the world's leading biotechnology companies is balancing innovation and profitability, using technology to improve drug development, and recruiting some of the best minds in medicine. So I traveled to Thousand Oaks, California to sit down with Bob Bradway, the chairman and CEO of Amgen. Bob, thanks for being here. Really nice to see you. Thanks for having us on campus. I thought maybe a great place to start is your early career. You weren't always a biopharma executive. You started out in, in finance. How did you make your way to uh, biopharma? Uh, my early career, boy, that's starting to uh, feel like a long time <laughs> ago. I was a biology major in college and actually had enrolled in medical school before discovering that there was a biotechnology group being formed at uh, Morgan Stanley and that that group was hiring bright, young, hardworking people. And so I had an opportunity to join that group. So I deferred medical school and, and went to Morgan Stanley and spent the early parts of my career um, studying, advising companies in biotechnology and in the pharmaceutical sector. And then instead of going to medical school, I went to business school and after business school returned to Morgan Stanley. And then I was very fortunate in 2006 to have an opportunity to join Amgen. How did some of that experience shape the way you know, you've thought about running Amgen and, and leading the company? I was probably thinking about uh, strategy chessboard perhaps more than I would have otherwise and thinking about innovation in the context of having to earn a return on the capital that we invest in in, uh, in trying to advance new medicines. How do you think about innov investing in innovation and, and what sort of drives innovation at Amgen? Well, we, we like to say at Amgen, uh, innovate or die. We believe that uh, we can earn a return on innovation uh, where we're able to generate innovative new molecules that have a very big effect size for the patients that use them where the medical needs are high. If we're able to advance medicines that keep people out of the hospital, uh, that don't just marginally make a condition better, but profoundly make a condition better, then society should see that as a good investment as well. You know, many of your peers have oriented their businesses towards rare diseases or, or specialized diseases where prices are high and the market size may be smaller. And you've continued to invest in general medicine and cardiovascular where the categories are very big and the impact to society is very big, but it's many people in the industry think it's harder to earn a return on those categories. Again, our focus is on innovation uh, in areas of high unmet medical need where we think we can advance medicines that make a big difference. Uh, so for example, cardiovascular disease is the leading killer of people all around the world. Uh, so one in three deaths uh, in, in the world are due to heart disease. And 85% of that heart disease is heart attack or stroke. Uh, and the leading cause of heart attack and stroke is having LDL levels, or the so-called bad cholesterol levels, uh, too high. Uh, and we have a therapy called Repatha that profoundly lowers uh, the LDL levels in the blood. And as a result of that, significantly reduced the risk of uh, heart attack and stroke. It's not lost on us that, um, that others made different decisions. But what I would point out is, if you look back to the race that was uh, being run at the time, we weren't alone. So many of our competitors dropped out because they weren't successful in being able to uh, advance molecules, to get them approved by regulators, or they had fallen so far behind us that it no longer made sense to try to enter that field. So, you know, it's a little bit of both. You have to have innovation and you have to have it in a competitive position um, and you have to feel you can make a big difference. I think one of the other things on innovation is people. Obviously, um, having really good talent makes an important impact on R&D. How does Amgen remain competitive and what are the kinds of the programs that you put in place to yeah. attract and retain the best people? Yeah, well, you're right. Um, there's nothing more important than people. And one thing that's very clear uh, at Amgen is that our most talented people want to work with the most talented people. Uh, and so the common denominator is um, making sure that we're creating an environment uh, for them to pursue the science, to push the boundaries of biotechnology, 
uh, and people who want to push the boundaries of knowledge and want to be part of the process of changing the practice of medicine are attracted to an environment like this where we have the resources necessary and the caliber of people around them across all the different parts of our business to be able to successfully do that. Common thread is um, people who didn't accept no for an answer. And that attracts other people who want to be part of that kind of an innovative uh, environment. You know, you pointed to the fact that some of your original medicines um, made a big impact on patients and therefore they were hugely successful, but they also represented a very large portion of your revenue. And you, know, you, had, to, you had to transition away from them. The effect of life in our industry is patent expiration. You know, we innovate, design, develop, you know, get, get new drugs approved, and for a period of time we enjoy patent protection for those medicines. But when those patents expire, there's competition and the prices for those medicines collapse and they're, therefore they're available basically for free for the rest of time for society. Like that's part of uh, being in this industry. And you know, one of the things that, that we take some pride in at, at Amgen is accepting reality as it is, not as we wish it to be. Uh, and we recognize that we operate in a long life cycle business. So it's not a surprise uh, when a patent's gonna expire. The kinds of drugs you make are, are biologics and there wasn't a pathway for a long time to make generic versions of those drugs. So when that pathway came around and you could see that you were actually gonna to start to face competition, was that an existential threat to the company or you'd always been planning for that and, and were prepared? No, we didn't think so. We, in fact, were uh, involved in helping shape the legislation that created a pathway in this country for the biosimilars that you're referring to, which means you know, uh, taking somebody else's molecule uh, and making uh, an approved version of it and introducing that as an alternative to the innovator. So no, I don't think it was an existential threat. Uh, we realized at some point our patents would expire and that there would be competitive products to those uh, originators of ours. Um, and we wanted there to be clarity about the, uh, the biosimilars, clarity as relates to the, the quality of them, clarity as relates to the regulations through which they could get approved and ultimately brought to market. And when we saw the legislation that was eventually uh, written into law, we felt it was quite constructive and uh, concluded that we were going to invest in our own biosimilar platform. And we've become the largest players in the biosimilar field globally. And we think as we look out through the uh, rest of this decade, that our commitment to biosimilars will be an important source of growing cash flow and uh, earnings and revenues. One of the things you hear sort of broadly, not just in your industry, is about the influence of technology and you know, AI and machine learning. How are you using that? Is that gonna be a major driver of innovation? We're incredibly excited about what's happening at the intersection of biology and computing technologies, and in particular, uh, machine learning. Um, and uh, we had been anticipating for some time that the moment uh, would arrive when it was possible to substitute much of what we've historically done in our laboratories with models of those laboratories uh, on computers. And in particular, we have been waiting for an appropriate solution to the to, um, to, to have models to describe the structure of proteins. Uh, and it's a very cumbersome, expensive, time-consuming process uh, to predict or to discern the structure of a protein. In the summer of 2021, a really important breakthrough happened in the field of artificial intelligence when a group reported and made available their software that now predicts protein structure uh, from uh, amino acid sequence. So that's a big deal. It's something we had been anticipating would happen. It's something we wanted to be poised to capitalize on. Uh, and as soon as it was reported, we began downloading the software and using it in the way we design molecules. We were literally in position to uh, apply that overnight. And we are already seeing benefits in the speed at which we're able to design new molecules. Making a drug is complicated. How does that sort of influence how you think about capital priorities? Manufacturing uh, biologic medicines is a highly complex, science-rich process. We have throughout our history seen that as an area of uh, potential competitive differentiation. You have to have high quality, reliable, efficient manufacturing or you're out of business. And our industry is littered with companies that lost control of their destiny because they couldn't reliably manufacture complex molecules. You also talked about how earning an effective return on deployed capital is, is important. I think when I survey a lot of other companies, sometimes that's not something that they lead with. What's your philosophy there? How have you thought about 
orienting the business and you know what are some of the metrics that you you follow internally well it's it's not very complicated it's it's very straightforward and our staff understand that we have an obligation to return capital to our shareholders uh, and we have an obligation to be successful in the uh, resources that we invest in innovation uh, to generate future sales, earnings, cash flows, future products for patients in need. In an industry like this, where you have long life cycles, uh, we have lots of things going on from the moment you have the first idea about a medicine to when you get that approved and then earn the cash flows from it. Um, you know, you have to be able to have the discipline of saying, you know, it's great innovation, we want to pursue it, but we have to be able to earn a return for our investors or we're out of the game. Bob. Really great conversation. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Thank you, Matthew. All right. See you soon.